we do have a role to play. We do have jurisdiction over his budgets. And we can say that there are initiatives that we want him to follow. In fact, you cited many of those initiatives that have come forward, uh, Chairwoman uh, Mitchell, regarding the Civilian Oversight Commission, as well as other entities that we have created, the OIG, to help provide assistance. But we found those in lacking, and yet we continue to see intimidation and harassment from this department. And where, when there is misconduct, the expectation is that there will be consequences. We also expect that the leader of the largest sheriff's department in the country will abide himself by the law and respect structures and systems of accountability and transparency. Rather, as far back as a decade, as you said as well, former Sheriff Lee Baca, and sadly, with this current sheriff's lack of respect for oversight, we've seen leadership act with impunity that has cost the county millions and millions of dollars and has contributed to generational and community trauma and harm. The board, as you know, is responsible for guiding and setting policies and the budget for all county departments, including the sheriffs. But with the latter, it comes with limitations. What is in front of us is an opportunity today that we can put before the voters to amend the county charter to give the board the authority to remove a sheriff under certain for cause criteria. This isn't about a blanket removal of a sheriff's constitutional authority. Rather, when there is cause, when the individual in the position of sheriff engages in a violation of law related to the performance of their duties as sheriff, flagrant or repeated neglect of duties, a misappropriation of public funds or property, or willful falsification of a relevant official statement or document, or obstruction of any investigation into the conduct of the sheriff by the inspector general, civilian oversight commission, or any other government agency with jurisdiction to conduct such an investigation. Indeed, we need better checks and balances over the sheriff in instances in which immediate intervention by county governments, governance is needed. We can't just sit back and watch the destruction of a wayward sheriff. The impact has a devastating ripple effect within the department and on the reputation and relationship the sheriff department has with over 10 million people who we call LA home. We have seen what happens when this doesn't exist. The resolutions are delayed, the problems and the damage become larger, and trust continues to erode. The department is inundated with lawsuits, consent decrees, investigations by state and federal investigations, calls for investigations from the state and federal legislators about deputy gangs. It is not only shameful, but it presents a harmful facade that the sheriff can do anything in, in, in LA County unchecked. In fiscal year 2019 through 2020, the county settled $60 million worth of lawsuits resulting from the sheriff. I just think of the million, millions of dollars that have gone to settle LASD lawsuits that could have gone to the county's Care First initiatives like youth programming, mental health services in the jails, job training, and community investments. This should be a clear signal to the current and future sheriffs and their administration that oversight and accountability is the other side of the same coin for public safety. The amendment to the charter can create, in my opinion, a robust accountability infrastructure to ensure there is responsive mechanisms in place to shut down corruption, misconduct, and errant behavior and culture from within and from atop. If a sheriff is not able to follow the law, obstructs investigations conducted by our oversight entities like the OIG, and Sheriff Civilian Oversight Commission and engages in misconduct, the board needs stronger mechanisms to check these types of harmful behavior. And I believe that should the voters approve this amendment to the charter, this can help us fulfill our responsibility to ensure their peace and safety. With that, Madam Chair, I thank you for allowing me to be your co-author. And I thank the many, many residents that called in today sharing their very personal stories, their grief, their hardship, and their, their patience for us to do something to help them. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I encourage uh, my board colleagues to vote aye on the measure. Thank you. Thank you. First, we'll hear from Supervisor Barger, who will be followed by Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you, and thank you both for your comments, and I appreciate the intent of the motion, although 
I have significant concerns about the proposed charter amendment. I really do believe that it sets a dangerous precedent and, quite frankly, creates a slippery slope. While I do not condone, and I repeat, I do not condone the actions of the current sheriff, and I've spoken out when necessary. Um, I know that my commissioner uh, has been very vocal, Commissioner Bonner, as it relates to his blatant disregard for subpoenas, for transparency, and the overall frustration that um, he feels that he is above the law. So there is no question that the actions taken by the sheriff have actually provided you all with something, uh, a vehicle to introduce uh, a motion like this. But I, I just want to remind you that the county council put together a report that gave the four ways to remove an elected official from office. It can be one, initiated by the civil grand jury, by presenting a written accusation to the district attorney against any county officer for willful or corrupt misconduct in office. Number two, the attorney general may file a quo warranto action seeking removal based on conviction of a felony malfeasance in office involving moral corruption and dishonesty. Or three, a recall by a number of signatures representing at least 10% of registered voters in the county. And lastly, what's before us today, a charter amendment that provides the Board of Supervisors with the authority to remove a county elected official. And I want to note that while the Board is choosing to place this on the ballot, the voters also have the option to place this on the ballot on their own initiative. But I'm also concerned about the timing of this action given the sheriff's election is less than four months away and the voters will have an opportunity to cast their vote. The motion appears to be more about an individual than the office of the sheriff or promoting accountability and community safety through checks and balances. I believe that the goal of this board is, as a title in the measure states, then it should not apply just to the sheriff, but to all elected officials. All of us are not above the law, and we certainly have seen other county officials in all three countywide elections facing issues as it relates to questionable actions while in office. Um, San Bernardino, which actually did do something in 2002, moved forward the Charter Amendment, which included all countywide elected officials. So the assessor, the district attorney, and the sheriff were included when they did this in 2002. What's more, we have over 700,000 signatures being reviewed by the registrar recorder as we speak, as part of a recall action of the district attorney. Surely the people have spoken um, loud, loud and clear on the effort, yet today's action is not listening to their voices by including the DA as part of this charter. Moving forward with this amendment by limiting it to the sheriff with less than four months away from elections is ripe for speculation. And I truly do believe is highly political and perhaps most troubling. I think it dilutes the office or the voice of the Los Angeles County voters and is going to deepen voter apathy. Another very troubling aspect of this uh, action is one that can be really what I describe as a slippery slope are the details and definition of cause for removal. I understand that county council has not yet fully drafted those details. I understand that such details in the ordinance may be revised in the future long after the charter amendment has been approved by the voters. One of the concerns expressed and Supervisor uh, Solis brought it up today is the high cost of litigation for law enforcement services. However, this does not constitute grounds for removal for the sheriff. I asked the county council about this yesterday. And I would point out that DCFS DHS, the coroner, have had, had high litigation costs that are out of their control. It is the nature of the job that they do, and that is the reality. So, you know, when I look at DCFS, we have paid a lot of money out, but we're not holding the DCFS director accountable for that litigation cost. So I think that is an unfair um, uh, justification to move forward with the, uh, the removal of a sheriff uh, for what is called just cause. Again, I just want to caution us all that this action has broader implications than one individual, and I strongly disagree with the action. I think it ought to apply not only to one elected, but to all. And if we're going to do it for the sheriff, we should do it for the assessor, we should do it for the DA, and quite frankly, maybe for this board as well. I think accountability across the board should be in play. And so with that, I will be casting a no vote, but it's not in support of 
what the sheriff's actions are doing. And if, if anything, you know, I listened to the COC um, and I listened to my appointee, uh, Commissioner Bonner, who was incredibly frustrated. And by the way, frustrated with county council as well, because county council wanted to reissue a subpoena and he was saying, enough, go into court and basically do your job. We want enforcement done without delay. Because the sheriff is, is being defiant, although it was for um, someone else who was subpoenaed. But, but it, it, the point being, we need to be as aggressive as it relates to enforcement with what is going on right now. And I believe that doing this charter amendment for one office um, undermines uh, really the credibility of this board as well. So I will not be able to support this. Um, you know, someone asked me if it had the additional three offices, would I? And I'll be honest with you, I probably would support it because I think that then it looks like it's being applied across the board. But um, based on the reasons given, I think this is more personal than it is um, about um, the office of the sheriff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Kuhl, followed by Supervisor Hahn. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I have such respect for my colleague and my seatmate, um, Supervisor Barger, even more when I disagree with her on almost everything she says. Um, I am doing my job if I do this. You say to me, let's do our jobs. I am doing my job if I vote for this. Uh, if I were on the city council um, and the city of Los Angeles or virtually any city with a police chief, I would be able to vote to remove him. I would be able to ask the mayor to remove him, it, depending on what the city charter says. And it is an important thing because this particular elected office is more powerful. I don't see the assessor getting people killed. Uh, you know, I mean, this thing about the DA, I'll tell you, well, we'll talk about that later. Um, it is not for me just about this sheriff. It's really about the ability to hold someone accountable when they have a very powerful position. You want to talk about the five of us who people have, uh, I guess they don't mean it uh, as a compliment, but I always took it as one, the five little queens. Um, I have been told this is a very powerful position but I have not been able to get anything through just with my own vote. Quite amazing. This is a democratic, and I mean with a small d, body. I need two of my colleagues to agree that what I want to do makes sense. If there were five sheriffs and three of them had to agree on whether people could be in gangs or not, I'd feel a lot better about it because we are a natural, what shall I say, limit on each other. And uh, for all the people out there that think, oh, we just all think alike or we all agree or we're all very crony, we are friends and we do respect each other. But by God, we don't agree on half of everything. And I'm given the possibility and the responsibility to express what I think is right for this county and for my constituents. And if I don't get agreement, it doesn't get enacted. That is the check. Where's the check on the sheriff? I believe this is the appropriate thing to do. Now, we probably would not have thought of it if this sheriff had not been so egregious in his behavior. And now that we look back and we see that Sheriff Baca was not in control of his department for a couple of the last years and that it was sort of running rogue based on the people who were working with him, it gives us pause, too, as to why the board before us might not have taken the same action. So I strongly support this, and it's, to me, it's not political. To me, it's about power. As I look around this country, and I see the different ways in which people are taking power, they take it by lying, they take it by roiling up, um, you know, uh, some kind of phony opposition. I mean, uh, just read the paper every day, I don't have to tell you. And I think the sheriff is trying to consolidate his power in the same way. He took credit for housing people who were unhoused along the Venice boardwalk. He was not responsible for one 
person getting housing. It was all St. Joseph's and Mike Bonin. All of it, and we know it, because some of us were actually there. But the sheriff wears his hat, he takes credit, and everyone goes, oh, well, you know, he's just done these good things. Walk through the locker room of deputies and see how many um, sort of insignia you see for the proud boys, for the 3%, for all the people we're hearing about in the January 6th hearings. As a matter of fact, some of our own deputies are under investigation about whether they were there and what their actions were. Do you hear from the sheriff about that? You do not. So somebody has to check that power, especially the power that he has over those who are incarcerated, who are the least able to protect themselves and have any kind of humane treatment. I give him credit for what he did during the pandemic in terms of taking responsibility to uh, lessen the population. I think that was good. It's not just about Alex, but he certainly did give us reason and give us pause about the, all of the power. This is the appropriate way to go. We've received a lot of support from our constituents about this, and it's not just people who've lost their kids, though there are many of them. There are many people who are upset about bicyclists being stopped, but they all happen to be Latino. Um, oh, by accident? No. Somebody has to be a leader, a responsible leader. The five of us, in my opinion, really try to do that, and when we don't, the other four really check them. That is checks and balances in our government. There is none on the sheriff. I'm going to vote aye. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Hahn? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you to you and Supervisor Solis for bringing this forward to us today. I believe um, one of the first uh, organizations that brought it to our attention was our own uh, Citizens Oversight uh, Committee. Uh, I think they brought this in May, uh, asking us if we would consider uh, putting a charter amendment on uh, the November ballot. Uh, and I, I think that speaks volumes. Uh, they are the citizens group uh, that is charged with overseeing uh, the, the sheriff's department, and they have been frustrated. I know my own commissioner, J.P. Harris, has expressed frustration. Uh, he was hoping maybe we would consider uh, not doing it for November and waiting till after the election uh, so as not to uh, sort of muddy the waters, but I don't think there's appetite uh, here on the board to do that. Uh, I believe... Uh, the voters have a right to decide how their county government works. And the charter for the county of Los Angeles uh, tells us how to operate. Uh, and it, it speaks very clearly about the different uh, powers and uh, operations of county government. So I'm going to support uh, putting this issue before the voters uh, and allowing them to decide if there needs to be an additional check on the office of the sheriff. I'm curious to see um, the outcome of this and whether or not uh, the voters in LA County do wanna give uh, the five supervisors uh, this extra power. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see the outcome. I have received over a thousand <laughs> uh, emails uh, many calls uh, from people uh, from all over uh, that have urged us to do this. I think the last thing I would want to say to our lawyers as they draft this, um, uh, based on if we pass this or not, uh, that they uh, really make sure that they're specific in identifying what type of behavior would qualify for removal. Uh, I am wary of any uh, vague language that would in any way um, leave it up to, uh, you know, uh, 
matters that uh, that aren't exactly spelled out and that rise to the level of of this body with a four fifths vote removing uh, another elected official in the county of Los Angeles. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I, I I would just like to say that at, at no point. Um, since being elected to this position, have I ever speculated about what motivates a member to bring a matter before us? Um, for me, as the author of the motion, it is not political in the least. It is a reflection you know, to the question of timing. It is a reflection of months, months of collaborative work, working with my co-author, um, her staff, um, key stakeholders, all of the oversight groups, not only here in LA County, but across the state. Um, as you said, the Oversight Commission brought it before us in May, but it was also a option listed before us when we got the report back from County Council my first couple of months here on the board about a year and a half ago. And so uh, the timing is a reflection of building the best most appropriate language in a collaborative fashion possible. And as the author of the amendment, I would say, not political. I'd also offer that um, I have a voting record of having co-authored and supported and taken action on legislation when I was a member of the state legislature that did hold the body that I was sitting on accountable for actions. And so I have no issue with that. If a member of this board were to put forth similar work and bring forward a motion that would expand this concept, I know Brown Amendment doesn't allow us to say what we would vote on uh, before it's before us, but I would certainly be open to review if a member of this body were to bring such a motion forward. In the meantime, thank you all for your thoughtful deliberation of the item that's before us today, number 12. Uh, I will be happy to move it. I will ask Supervisor Solis to second it to approve the item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 12 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. No. Supervisor Barger, no. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to one. We'll now move on to item 14, aligning the Marina Del Rey with Los Angeles County priorities for equity and inclusion, uh, another item that I held. As of December of 2021, the second supervisorial district changed significantly. It now includes multiple beach communities that have never been part of the district before, which includes Marina Del Rey. The Marina is such a unique part of the county. Built in the 60s, it's the second largest built harbor in the world, and it's entirely owned by the county. I have to say, as a native Angelino, that was new interest information to me, Supervisor Hahn. It's entirely owned by the county. Since its creation, the marina has been leased to different developers with extensions and new leases determined on a parcel by parcel basis. As a result, the marina is currently occupied by many buildings and uses envisioned decades ago before the county had established the priorities that guide our policy decisions today. With many of these leases now nearing expir expiration and with clear guidance from this board on our collective priorities, it's time that we think about the marina in a more strategic and comprehensive way. We have a clear opportunity to align our decisions as to this regional asset with our priorities of anti-racism, diversity, inclusion, poverty alleviation, and more. The marina's waterfront, parks, wildlife habitats, and hospitality should be accessible and enjoyed by all. So today, I'm asking that the Department of Beaches and Harbors take on an unprecedented effort to bring county leaders, as well as community members and other important stakeholders together to create a roadmap on where we go from here starting with an assessment of our most urgent needs. I'm asking the director of the Department of Beaches and Harbors to report back to this board on how we can complete appropriate assessments, identify solutions, and make recommendations for next steps. 
I also want to make it clear that I've asked labor to be a voice at the table as we reimagine the marina into a thriving community that can be modeled as a best practice for inclusive community development. While we explore how we can take a holistic approach to creating an anti-racist, welcoming, world-class marina, we expect robust community engagement. Creating a plan for the highest and best use of the marina will require partnership with public and the private sector, labor, and community while we, pri while we prioritize worker voice and quality jobs. At the same time, our small businesses are the backbone of our regional economy and we have been hardest, and have been hardest hit by the pandemic. We must ensure that we support their equitable economic recovery through this process as well. And while this is only the beginning, the goal is the creation of a strategic plan for the long-term use of this critical county asset that ensures the marina, Marina Del Rey, will continue to thrive while becoming more accessible than ever. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Supervisor Hahn. Oh, thank you, um, uh, Supervisor Mitchell. I represented uh, Marina Del Rey uh, for the first few years. I applaud you uh, in this effort, and uh, you're right. It really is county-owned. Uh, I mean, it was a man-made marina, but now it's woman-propelled. Uh, and uh, it is a, it is, it's kind of like a golden egg, uh, golden goose uh, for the county, and we do control it. Uh, one of the proposals that we were uh, able to do for the very first time in the history was to require 20% affordable housing in the new uh, housing developments, and we worked on labor peace uh, at the at the hotel. So I 100% applaud you for taking this even further, and rightly so. Uh, it, it is owned by all the people of uh, the county of Los Angeles, and it has seemed in the past to limit uh, the uh, welcoming accessibility uh, to everyone uh, in the county. So I applaud you for doing this, and I support you 100%. Any questions or comments? <laughs> See, no further mics raised. Supervisor Solis, I didn't miss you, did I? No. Okay, thank you. Hearing no other comments, item 14 is uh, before us. I'll move and ask that Supervisor Hahn second it uh, to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 14 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Item 15, expanding the life sciences industry while creating equitable high road career opportunities for our local communities. Again, colleagues, I've held this item. Uh, from my time serving in the legislature, California legislature to now, and as chair of the board, it's been amazing to see the rapid growth of LA's life science sector. California is home to some of the most incredible breakthroughs humankind has ever seen, including those launched right here in LA County. If the county is to fulfill its promise to build back equitably, we really must create quality, family-sustaining wage jobs for our historically marginalized. This includes a life sciences cradle to career employment pipeline. With this motion, we will invest in both place and people by one, improving STEAM education and career exploration in elementary through high schools in our hardly reached communities, increasing the availability of robust paid training opportunities for youth with, with an interest in the industry, improving and promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in employer hiring and recruitment practices, and creating an anti-displacement policies and enforcement mechanisms that help prevent gentrification. It's essential that our county's brand new Department of Economic Opportunity work closely with this sector and employer partners to strengthen and streamline career pathways with homegrown talent focused on our youth who are underrepresented in the life sciences sector. 
Our life sciences cradle to career employment pipeline will create a robust life science sector that offers opportunities for all Angelenos and creates the innovative treatments and cures of tomorrow. I ask that you support me in this motion. Any questions or comments from board members? Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I wholeheartedly support this motion. I think it's uh, high time that we do more in every way we can to help increase the representation of people of color, women, and others in these particular areas. And this has been something that this board has taken a position on as long as I know I've been on the board. I know that uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, Supervisor Kuehl, we have always fought very hard for this representation. And I can tell you as uh, one of those individuals who has two younger siblings who at an early age decided they wanted to go into science and engineering, two young Latina twins that they were discriminated against in high school and even in college. And it was so hard for them to be included and have the ability to be successful attending even UCLA in the uh, engineering program. I know what it is that they face so much hardship and discrimination and so many of our young people have so many talents and skills if they're only given a choice and opportunity. And we give them not a handout, but a hand up and motivation. And that's what this program will do. And especially in light of what we've just gone through in the pandemic with the recession and inflation. And we need these opportunities for our people of color to have a place in position in society to help lift up our economy. So I am fully supportive of this and thank you for introducing the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, um, item 15 is before us. I'll move, ask that Supervisor Solis second it to approve the item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 15 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 22, invested in gun violence prevention, which is held by Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to thank uh, Supervisor Solis for co-authoring this motion with me. Um, uh, most of what I'm going to say will not be very unfamiliar at this moment, but I'm going to say it anyway. Gun violence in America is not a new problem. As a matter of fact, there was a meme going around not long ago that went something like, America is a gun, Great Britain is a cup of tea, France is a wheel of brie, you know, it was a, a poem like that. But every five stanzas, it was like, America is a gun. Um, but it is a problem that's becoming more and more pervasive. I think people have it more and more on their minds. The shootings, the mass shootings that we see and hear about, the ones we don't see and hear about, where you, you read at the end of a week, there were 24 more mass shootings this past week. Accessibility to guns is obviously a big factor, along with permissive laws about who can legally obtain a gun and where they're allowed to be present. It seems like now they're everywhere. The recent Supreme Court ruling in the Bruin case, which overturned New York's practice of issuing concealed carry licenses on the basis that a person must prove they had a unique self-protection need. That was overturned. It's deeply concerning. As it expands gun rights at a time when we so obviously need stricter regulations. Um, everyone would agree, I think, we don't need looser ones a time when people are needing and wanting a greater sense of safety and then are now faced with the decision and the reality that this particular Supreme Court decision will lead to more guns in public spaces and presumably more senseless and potentially deadly acts of violence. Simultaneously, speaking of the sheriff, we have a sheriff who's indicated he wants to reduce CCW restrictions CCW is a permit to carry a concealed weapon. He wants to make it easier for people to obtain a CCW permit, meaning they will be able to legally have on their person a concealed gun outside their home. 
This doesn't inspire confidence that public safety will be improved. In fact, it does quite the opposite because every indicator shows that more guns have not led to safer communities. So what can we do? Well, one of the things we're looking at is how to move additional resources into gun violence prevention. For instance, we know the cost associated with processing these CCW applications and issuing permits is significantly higher than what the Sheriff's Department is currently charging. So all this motion is about is doing a deep dive into the uh, LA Sheriff Department CCW process, ascertaining what are the actual costs related to issuing such a permit, and determining if the difference between the current fees and the actual costs could be not only collected, but then utilized for violence prevention initiatives in our county. In the meantime, this motion also directs the Sheriff's Department to immediately stop any changes to its CCW policy until we get guidance from the Attorney General and the County Council on this matter. We need to be creative about how to address the very real and escalating public health emergency that is gun violence, and this motion is a step in that direction. I ask for your I vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Supervisor Kuehl, for inviting me to co-author the motion. And I, too, agree that I don't think it should come as a surprise that this board stands firmly against gun violence and will continue to advocate strongly for gun safety and gun violence prevention. You know, in the last few months, many motions have been put forward by this board and supported by the board. This is yet another motion that will ensure that LA County, County continues to be a beacon of hope during a time in which mass shootings has somehow tragically become a part of so many Americans' daily lives. And I'm sure, like others, it was upsetting to learn the Supreme Court's ruling to overturn New York's concealed to carry gun law a most insensitive ruling that came at the heels of some of the deadliest weeks in America's history with dozens of people who were murdered as a result of gun violence. Prior to the ruling, the number of CCW licenses issued in LA County by the sheriff continued to rise and increase. Since he's taken office, the number of CCW license issuances have increased by fivefold. What is not increased, however, is the cost, as you pointed out, Supervisor Kuehl, and I believe we are undercharging those who are applying for CCWs, resulting in the county having to pay that balance. In the name of public safety, we need to ensure we're abiding by law and any advertisement by our state attorney general, I'm sorry, any advisement by our state attorney general and our county council on the county CCW policy is needed. We also need to make sure that we're re-examining the cost and ensure that those who wanna get CCWs are paying for the full cost of that expenditure. And I'm also concerned by the sharp increase in the CCW issuance. And I'm glad to see that this motion directs the auditor controller to conduct an audit of this process. There should be no corners cut, a decrease in vigilance of any sort to make sure guns and CCW licenses are not falling into the wrong hands. Again, I reiterate that I will do all I can to ensure that our residents are safe from gun violence at a time in which access to guns seems to become easier and easier. I too support the motion wholeheartedly. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl for bringing it forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl, Supervisor Solis for bringing forward this motion. Uh, I too was devastated when the Supreme Court overturned uh, New York's concealed uh, carry gun law it was it's devastating and it's made a lot of us uh really angry uh with uh, that and many other decisions that are coming out of this court um and if uh, we're angry that uh, so-called gun rights are being valued more than human lives uh, we don't know exactly yet how the supreme court ruling will play out here in El in uh, california and what it will mean for our uh, concealed carry system so that's why this motion is important i think it's uh, important that the sheriff's department not make any changes uh, before we've heard back from our lawyers and the attorney general on how we can and should proceed uh, we need to make sure we're doing everything we can to protect our communities from gun violence uh, almost exactly a month ago, uh, this board approved a motion that I introduced uh, with Supervisor Solis 
to ask our county council for options for common sense gun regulations that uh, we can enact here at the local level. And I think getting those options are more important now than ever. And I've uh, asked our lawyers to make sure that they take into account this new Supreme Court uh, ruling when they give us their recommendations. I think we should be getting that back next month. Um, this board cares deeply uh, about protecting our communities from gun violence. I wish our Supreme Court felt the same way. But in the meantime, uh, I think we do uh, have to do whatever we can to protect our constituents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Barger. Thank you. You know, I, I support this motion, but I have one question, and that is, so in November of 2020, the board approved the sheriff's request to increase the fee applications from 66 to 150 dollars but the auditor controller had reviewed the actual cost processing the ccw applications and determined it to be 340 dollars and 56 cents so the auditor controller calculated what the actual cost is to issue a ccw the proposed increase though remained at 150 and it was based on what they're saying aligning with neighboring counties which I really don't understand because I thought that the CCW had to be tied to the individual where that individual lives. So to me, I don't understand why we didn't increase it to the 340 to, to get the actual cost because the sheriff always complains about how his budget, you know, is in a deficit. Well, this creates a greater deficit. Um, and so I, I guess we should have listened to the auditor controller and verified that. Having said that, now we're going to say, and I agree with the part of your motion that talks about number four about above, report back with analysis of whether any revenue from the CCW fees can be used for the county's violence prevention initiatives. My question to you is, can you add language that would say or impose a, a, a fee that as part of the CCW in addition to the actual cost to cover um, the, the personnel time uh, to issue a CCW. So if it's 340, add $50 on to a concealed weapon permit, so it'd be $400. And of that 450 would go automatically into this so that we can recover the actual cost to do a CCW. Because my concern is, is that we are now doing like an unfunded mandate. We're saying we already know that, that it costs $340, but um, we're going to actually take the the 160 and a portion of that and possibly move that over a department which creates a greater deficit. I'm just, I'm just trying to um, uh, be objective as it relates to the actual cost of uh, processing a CCW because I agree that we need to put a hold on redefining um, what, um, who, or what qualifies or who can get a CCW. Uh, I don't think now is the time to broaden that, um, but I also, recognize that if the actual cost to do a legitimate CCW is $340.56, we should be recovering that cost. Taxpayers should not be subsidizing the cost for someone to get a CCW. The cost should be paid and bared by that individual. And, um, and I would ask that if we do want to invest in the violence prevention initiatives, that we, should, we have the ability to impose a surtax, if you will, onto a CCW that will be dedicated toward that. And so I would just ask that maybe that be considered, um, Supervisor Kuehl, only because I don't want to further take away resources um, where we already know there's a deficit. And I just find it ironic the sheriff never brought that up as an issue when he complains about how his budget is upside down. Um, so I would just uh, ask um, for consideration on that. And other than that, I, I support it. I'm going to support it even if you don't accept that. But I think that it's a problematic as it relates to um, taking money that is going to actually cover um, personnel costs. And those are probably not even sworn that are doing that personnel cost. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, if I may answer. Please. Um, I, I think that uh, it wasn't entirely clear whether adding money that was not part of the cost was, would be supportable uh, in terms of charging a fee for something. Because, you know, you have to have a basis upon which you 
have a reasonable fee. So what we thought might be the better answer for this motion, at least, was um, to ask for the actual cost, but it's estimated because it would be the hours that are needed by the clerk, you know, to manage it, the cost of the application, et cetera. Um, and then I think the actual expenditure would be a look back. And then the look back would be, here's what it actually cost in all those hours for those permits. And if there's money left over, we wanted an opinion from council if it could then be used for violence prevention, because that's not totally clear. But I think if you add on ahead of time, it would be more challengeable um, a as part of the fee. So, so you don't know that it, it, it can be done legally, is what you're saying? You yeah, that's why okay. we asked yeah. for an opinion no, on I that. I got you, you know, I got you. Can we even use any of the money, even if there's some left over, got it. for these other things? Got it. And then, I'm sorry, I have one question, because I know Supervisor Solis said that the increase in CCWs has gone up five times, I think is what she said. We've been trying to get the number of CCWs that the sheriff is issuing, and I, I, I can't seem to get that number because um, I, I, I've heard two. I've heard that, and I've also heard that uh, that in fact they're not being issued. And I, I think it'd be helpful for us to know um, the number of CCWs that are that are are being issued. We don't have to know the names, but I think to quantify it would be helpful because when you hear that number, that is you know quite a bit, especially given that prior administrations were not handing out CCWs like candy. And I think it's important for us to understand what the numbers are. Um, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, any other questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, item 22 is before us, moved by Supervisor Kuehl, seconded by Supervisor Solis to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 22 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. We'll now move on to item 80, which is a report on compliance with the ROSIS agreement, which um, I thought it was important um, to hold for us to hear presentations. And so, colleagues, um, we're going to hear from a couple of different groups of people first. Uh, we're going to hear um, directly from the Sheriff's Department through Assistant Sheriff Brendan Corbett. Um, he'll present the report on um, compliance. Uh, we'll then also hear opening remarks from Max Huntsman, uh, the Inspector General, and Kathy Kinney, the County Monitor. Um, who will also be available for questions if you have any. We'll get started with you, Assistant Sheriff Corbett. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and good afternoon, Supervisors. Uh, as you know, we're, um, we're in the ROSIS uh, Settlement Agreement, and part of that is uh, Provision 1.4 requires a um, department to publicly report to the board and the public biannually our updates and, and our compliance. Next slide, please. Um, again, as I mentioned, 1.4 requires we publicly report this. So we'll be reporting on our implementation plan, status of our compliance, training on the use of force policy, use of force statistics and trends, and department use of force policy violations and inmate grievances. Next. And you know, let me, let me uh, put the caveat in. We're providing the information from the year 2020 and 2021. We always report on the year prior. Next slide, please. So just a little backstory, uh, the ROSAs is a federal class action lawsuit that was alleging a pattern of excessive force in the downtown jail facilities, which included Men's Central Jail, Twin Towers, and the Inmate Reception Center. Uh, the settlement was initially approved by court on 2015. It was after several years with CCJV and other entities uh, coming together to put the, uh, the provisions in place. And we began assessing compliance with the settlement effective July, 2018. Um, after establishing the revised compliant measures. And then we're, we're grouping this into seven categories, which is administrative, use of force, training, force reporting and forced investigations, grievances, restraint, and early warning system. There is a total of 104 provisions with a total of 402 compliance measures. Um, 
I want to take a minute here, supervisors, and, and actually go off script a little. Uh, you'll see at the bottom it says uh, Mr. Mark Harris resigned as of September 21 and has re been replaced by Kathy Kenny, and she is hopefully available today. But I also want to make a uh, a comment to Mr. Jeff Schwartz. Uh, Jeff was one of our monitors since the onset of 2015. Uh, he was a great partner, you know, a good collaborator. He he's made a difference in the culture and and in the jails, and he was uh, forced to resign his position a few weeks ago for health reasons. And I just want to acknowledge his efforts and everything he's done in this matter since that time. And uh, our best wishes are with him. Next slide, please. So what we've done in force mitigation and quality improvement efforts that we are, are ongoing uh, is we have continued weekly meetings with the division chiefs on a comprehensive review of force incidents. Um, the chiefs meet with all the units, they present the videos, they present the force, um, and they discuss patterns or improvements we can do in any of these fields. Um, we have last year implemented a, uh, lack of a better term, a head strike tracker. So any incidents that um, involve the use of head strikes and the use of force are tracked. We push that out to the unit commanders on a monthly basis, and it's a mechanism and a tool that they can look and to see if individuals or or there's patterns of anything we could address to try to identify problems or trends that we can we can uh, mitigate. Uh, as we did last year, uh, the sheriff approved body more cameras and a pilot program in Men's Central Jail. Um, I'll discuss that a little bit more in detail. But very very productive. We're real happy with it. Obviously, there's going to be some uh, costs incurred, but we think it's worth it. And honestly, the body worn camera was not a new concept. Uh, CCJV actually discussed it with the DVTEL back in 2010, 2012. They went with the DVTEL for uh, more exposure, more cameras, but the body worn has, has proven extremely effective, uh, especially with the audio capability. So we're, we're encouraged that we want to move forward with that. Uh, the RAP directive uh, is was under revision and so you're going to see two terms here in the RAP directive and the prohibited use of force directive. Uh, a directive is a, a policy in place until the formal policy is uh, accepted and, and gone through the vetting and signature process with all the stakeholders. So we've implemented a RAP directive and we're still working with the, uh, the stakeholders and the monitors before we do a formal uh, RAP policy on that. And if you're not aware, the RAP is a restraint device um, that is basically, um, it restrains and, and holds the, uh, individual's lower body and their hands are behind their back and their, their movement is restricted. Um, and, and we put in, a, uh, many prohibitive factors on that, that is a heavy in supervision to monitor and, and keep an eye on the individual, um, including medical assessments immediately. Uh, and then finally we've, we pushed out a prohibited use of force directive, limiting the use of personal weapons to the head, and the stakeholders are working with us to do the final changes to that. Um, again, these are in process and, and expanding. Next slide, please. So uh, reporting on the training statistics and where we are with that, um, and you can see in the compliance base and facilities in 2021, uh, force policy, the initial training completed, the force refresher, we're at 91%. Uh, ethics training, we're completed. The ethics training is 92%. Devert training, uh, the initial training is completed. And then the training refresher is at 98%. And then use of force writing and documentation is at 99%. Uh, one thing I wanna point out a little is you see the numbers from 2020 to 2021, you'll see the numbers for uh, Divert training went from 883 to 230, and that was a result of less academy classes. Um, the divert follows immediately after the academy for jail operations when they're presented that. So the, the lack of classes and the lack of uh, academy classes going through was less students being uh, trained in divert. And that's also, you'll see the uh, training refresher was less in 2020 because we had to scale back on some classes for COVID. 
and then you'll see it's increased back up to, in 2021. Some of that was, some of our classes were um, impacted by COVID and we had to stop the training and, and for obvious reasons. Next slide, please. Um, I know there's been questions on accountability and our opening administrative investigations. So as you'll see from 2019, 20 and 21, it's consistently gone up. These though uh, are all investigations. This could be anything from a policy violation to administrative for, um, you know, persons arrested for drunk driving or anything, not just specifically forced. This is all administrative investigations have increased. Next slide, please. This is specifically uh, administrative investigations for force related incidents. So you'll see from January, 2020 to December 30, 2020, um, we initiated 10 cases, nine found to be a violation of the use of force policy. One was unfounded. And then the following year in 2021, 14 cases were initiated. Uh, 11 were found to be in violation. One was unfounded, two are pending. Uh, normally what pending means is they may uh, have a criminal uh, component of it, which the administrative tolls until the, the criminal uh, end of it is completed. Next slide, please. So going into the downtown use of force, um, we're a little encouraged by this, I'll be honest with you. As you can see, force has consistently gone down every year since 2018. Um, we went from a total of 847 um, category ones to 819. You'll see a significant drop in 2020. And that was, we think a combination of a few factors, uh, COVID impact, uh, less movement within the facilities. We didn't close any housing areas to, to uh, mitigate the effect of COVID. So all the housing left open, there was just fewer inmates in there and fewer, less movement. Uh, they weren't going to court, they weren't going to program, they weren't going to that, which you would think that would be raising the level of anxiety and um, causing more force, but our personnel, and I, and I also wanna give credit to Correctional Health Services in this, they were doing a lot of town halls with us. They were informing the, uh, the persons in our care about what was going on. And I think that took some of the anxiety away. And then you'll see as, as we started coming out of the COVID restrictions in 2021, it's still less force than in 2019. So we're, we're going in the right direction. Next slide, please. So this is specifically the category one use of force, which is, um, and let me read this so I get the definition actually correct. It involves any of the following when there is no injury, but there was a takedown or use of OC spray or something like that, which involved um, discomfort, but no pain or injury. And you'll see again, it went, it's been tracking down consistently from 2018. Next slide, please. So category two is the next level up from category one. There is an identifiable injury or a complaint of pain from the use of force. And you'll see from 2018 to 2019, it did increase, but then we've been going down again from 2019 to 2021, taking 2020 out, it's a bit of an anomaly. And next slide, please. So category three are the, um, the most severe, um, that's a skeletal fracture, a hospitalization, or the use of an improvised weapon or a specialized weapon. And you'll see we went from uh, four in 2020 to five in 2021, but they did not consist of any head strikes. This was mainly the use of uh, uh, special weapons, a pepper ball gun or something of that nature. And um, maybe a, um, I believe one was a broken wrist that we weren't sure if the individual had it prior to our, our contact. Um, again, we're encouraged that the category threes are, are low and that's our most severe use of force. So again, we're encouraged by that. Next slide, please. So comparing the panels, uh, the monitors report from the ninth report and the 10th, um, they assess that the same total number of cases, 104, uh, you'll notice we're non-compliant Our compliance, uh, in 2019, I'm sorry. And the ninth report was 19 and it went up to 24. And the main increase was in the uh, force reporting. Um, we're, we're, they didn't like the compliance. We worked on that. Uh, the grievances have gone up a little and we're working with the monitors 
to ensure that the accurate reflection of the numbers on this. Next slide, please. And inmate grievances are also tracked. Um, fairly consistent. Uh, general grievances 2020, 2021 are consistent. They actually dropped in 2021. Um, complaints against staff increased in 2021. And you'll see the iPad requests uh, significantly dropped. That is a result of the iPads we have have basically um, lived their life. They, we've had them for many years now and they're starting to fail and they're just not available. And we're working with the CEO's office to try to replace those. Next slide, please. These are the top five grievances we've had in each one in 2020 uh, living conditions was the number one on both. Um, that could be anything from um, their housing, the, the conditions in their house and their in their uh, dormitories or cells to, you know, any type of food or anything that they, they have grievances for. Other uh, is a little more open. It's basically anything from their visiting to television to uh, work assignments, money accounts, and we're trying to do better at categorizing each of those individually so we get a better reflection of what exactly their their requests are. Um, mail is always a concern. In 2020, mail was a, um, a concern because some of the COVID effect of mail we had coming in. Uh, and again, mail is also a, uh, a method of bringing in um, contraband into the facility. So we have to do a good job of trying to screen that. Uh, service related procedural, that could be anything else other than uh, living conditions. Staff complaints uh, went up a little. And then the classification, I believe a lot of that in 2020 was based on COVID and people were trying to see if they were eligible for early release and that type of thing. So they, they continue to ask for their classification updates. Next slide, please. And I believe that might be all of them. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Assistant Sheriff Corbett, we'll ask you to stand by. We're going to hear the presentations, uh, the opening remarks from Inspector General Max Huntsman and Kathy Kinney. Uh, and we'll ask you to um, stand by. I'm sure we have questions. I have questions and other supervisors will have questions as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Yeah, Huntsman. Friend. And you're there we go. There we go. I apologize. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for letting me address you this afternoon. I want to uh, thank the monitors for this report, which is, I think, unique, certainly incredibly unusual, in that the, this report actually calls out serious problems that do not seem to be uh, in the process of being resolved. And I'll, I'll, there's a quote from the second paragraph. It says, it is time for the jail culture to stop supporting behaviors that are forbidden by policy. And the monitors talk quite a bit about a variety of specific problems, but most importantly about what they see as a lack of continuing effort on the part of the department to fix the problems that are in front of them. And I want to say that I greatly appreciate the monitors uh, making uh, these observations, and they are completely consistent with what my office has observed. As you know, a year and a half ago, we reported on the dismantling of the internal uh, discipline system which we, since then, we have not been permitted to examine it closely, so I can't comment on where it's at now, except to say that the uh, stats that you've got from the assistant sheriff there are, as he said, the overall stats. So while they show a lot of administrative investigations, they are, are not reflecting what Internal Affairs is doing or what Internal Criminal Investigations Bureau is doing, and that's the subject of our report that you can find online um, and which we've certainly uh, publicized quite a bit. The number of investigations as described for actual uses of force, about 10 per year, when we're seeing now a thousand uses of force in a year. So it's a tiny drop in the bucket of the cases. Um, most troubling to me is the increase in the um, amount of uh, category three violence. And prior to the current administration, uh, broken bones were, had almost all been eliminated and the serious uses of force were down to one in 2018 but in the past three years, they've, they've been four to five every single year. Just recently in June, we had an incident in the inmate reception center, uh, which appears to have involved broken bones and, and use of personal weapons against the head. 
which is called out in the monitor's report. And then just to right now, there's a story dropping on the Times about another incident. And uh, my office has supposedly received a presentation on it. I just want to be clear, that presentation was we were told about it and allowed to look at video, not allowed to keep it, not allowed to ex examine, not allowed to monitor the investigation or conduct our own investigation, uh, which I'll address at the end of my of remarks. Um, the primary problem in the jails isn't lack of desire on the part of sheriff's personnel, it's overcrowding. The jails are grossly overcrowded. They, the dip you saw in 2020 was because the population amount dipped. And as a result of that overcrowding, we're seeing inappropriate medical care being received. We're seeing um, bottlenecks forming in the inmate reception center where the, the violence has become most severe. And we're seeing other problems with it within uh, the, the jails. So that's the primary force. The, the presence of uh, violence is, of course, uh, of great concern to us and to the monitors. But we also share the monitors' concern about the lack of cooperation from the department. Uh, as they said on page four of their report, the norm now is to get a quick response of saying, oh, we'll, we'll get back to you and followed by nothing. And that's been our experience. As you know, You, this board has had to ask county council to bring a lawsuit to try to get compliance with oversight laws. And uh, that I think that lawsuit is the only thing that can cause us to move forward uh, and, and to eliminate the obstruction of our investigations, most notably, I think you've talked about it a little bit today, uh, the law enforcement gang problem under Penal Code 13670. Uh, I have brought to the Sheriff's Department recently uh, concerns about uh, some um, decorations in the Sheriff's Department that have names on them and the Sheriff's Department couldn't identify how the names got there and, and we're working with them on trying to get a thorough investigation, but we're not able to investigate despite our legal authority to do so. Uh, likewise, there was an allegation of the KKK infiltrating the jails and initially the investigation seemed to be uh, almost no investigation at all. I went out personally to the location to view the scene and that afternoon, one of the um, informants to the press received a phone call from a sergeant in the chain of command, not from internal affairs. And that was deeply disturbing to me. I've discussed that with the, the, the department and I believe they're gonna conduct a real investigation, we'll see. But these aren't isolated incidents. Uh, as I think you know, yesterday I went with the attorney general to the East Los Angeles station, the home of the banditos. And in the locker room saw a symbol of the three percenters that Supervisor Kuhl mentioned, a group whose members, some of them have been convicted in the violence on January 6th. And that's been a subject of our investigation. And like the monitors, uh, we haven't received uh, the documentation and compliance from the department that we're legally entitled to. So as a result, those matters are not getting investigated. Uh, so I, I share the concerns of the monitors. I'm happy to answer questions about specific issues within the jails. But unfortunately, ultimately, I think it's only the, the legal actions that this board has um, asked county council to undertake and the county council is undertaking that will um, result in improvement. Thank you very much, Mr. Huntsman. Um, is Ms. Kinney going to give an opening statement or is she just available to answer questions? I'll just do a brief introduction. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you and thank you for allowing me to participate. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm a Kathy Kenny. I'm one of the new monitors on the Roses case. Um, I come to this, this position having served 25 years with the Federal Bureau of Prisons and I retired as the agency's general counsel. I then have had the pleasure of working as a consultant for the Moss Group, who has the ability and, and a number of contracts around the country to go in and help systems achieve uh, operational compliance on a number of issues. So I think uh, my, my background will help in this new position. I'm very excited about it. I, I came on board at the very end of April. So I was not involved in writing or reviewing the last, the tenth report, the last report that was submitted in this matter, um, I have had a chance to do my first on-site visit. I, I visited all three jails in June, and uh, look forward to uh, continued service in this area. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Miss Kenny, thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to future discussions with you. Uh, let you. me um, turn it over to Supervisor Barger, followed by Supervisor Kuhl. Thank you, and thank you, Assistant Sheriff Corbett, and thank you, Max, um, for uh, you know giving us an overview. Uh, my question is for Assistant Sheriff Corbett. 
As I understand it, this agreement stipulates a minimum staffing level. Um, where is the department in meeting the staffing requirement? And I know that Max had mentioned the overcrowding issue. Um, in addition to the staffing, what are we doing to address that, especially in the IRC? Well, thank you, Supervisor, for that question. Uh, staffing was initially uh, identified through the CCJV, Civilian Commission on Jail Violence, and they identified specific staffing levels for specific locations with a heavy emphasis on supervision. Um, they wanted uh, sergeants, lieutenants, captains. That's when they actually identified two captains for the bigger facilities. Um, and we've been struggling with that significantly in the last two years. Uh, as the board knows, uh, we had 1,024 items stripped away from us in 2020 with the curtailments. And um, 69 of those, which is now uh, totaled 90, is that's how many sergeant vacancies and how many sergeants I'm short uh, in custody division alone. Uh, 580 of those were deputies, 56 bonuses, and 246 custody assistants. In order to even get to minimum staffing level supervisor, uh, to, as of today, I have 343 items from other areas of the department, patrol and detective division, that we had to take those items just to put my personnel on to do minimum staffing. So we are woefully understaffed. Um, and as I, I actually had this conversation with Ms. Kinney, she's reviewing force reports from over a year ago, uh, which is not within the compliance because I just do not have the supervisors to complete the reports timely enough. Well, we're doing everything we can, but with that uh, amount of, of cutting, uh, we're, we're unable to meet the compliance times time frames to get these things um, implemented. And, and for example, Mr. Huntsman uh, alluded to the IPA KKK um, incident at NCCF that came on our attention about the same time as his through that uh, the blog. And we take it very seriously. We, uh, in order to initiate an in internal investigation, we have to do a supervisor inquiry. And I believe that's what Mr. Huntsman was indicating was, was occurring. Um, and we've done that and it's 20 pages. The chief is reviewing it. He had some additional questions. And once that goes, it will go to the Internal Affairs Bureau for a full investigation. Um, but my confidence on that is, this was the first we've ever heard of it. Uh, Mr. Huntsman and his staff, the ACLU, uh, civil brand commissioners, uh, as of recently, the California Department of Justice inspectors have all been in there. This is the first time we've ever heard of anything like that. So we'll take it very seriously, but I do believe uh, the level of oversight we have in the jails uh, would have rang that bell previously if, if there was a problem or a systemic issue. But again, to have enough supervisors and that to do these inquiries timely and get them forward and do a full investigation, we're very much hampered. Um, so it, it, we're budgeted for 374 sergeants. We filled 300 and we're vacant 90. And as you know, the sergeants are the first line of supervision that should be out with the deputies, training them, monitoring the workplace, doing all that. But they're basically buried uh, with administrative duties of force reports and grievances. I hope that answers your question, yeah, Supervisor. What, what about the overcrowding that um, Mr. Huntsman um, mentioned uh, as being part of what may be causing this and how are we trying to address that, especially in the inmate um, reception? So I know that uh, Supervisor Solis did um, a motion last week to support us in the efforts in the IRC to um, for Correctional Health Services and, and Dr. Belovich to get some uh, more staffing and the backlog of, of any uh, those waiting for mental health evaluations and assessments and medical. Uh, and that's that's very much appreciated. Um, I need to point out the difference between uh, what Dr. Belovich and Dr. Golly can do is go on a registry and get more nurses and doctors. It takes 10 months to a year for me to get more deputies or anybody trained and hired and, and in place to support that. Currently at Men's Central Jail, I have 100 unfunded positions to support the clinic expansion we've done for CHS in the past year or two. So again, that's we're doing that out of hide without the additional funding. The inmate reception center is like Mr. Huntsman says, is, is where bottlenecks coming in. And there's two components to that. They have a medical assessment and a medical assessment. And then as you go uh, into the facilities and upstream for lack of a better term, 
if we also have uh, less clinic clinicians up there to evaluate D class or you know reclass individuals, then the backup starts, and that's what we seem to be experiencing. And again, I want to thank Supervisor Solis for the um, the support for JSIT to give us some funding for that to hopefully um, get around some of that backlog. But uh, but my my staffing is basically, ma'am. I'm mandating my sergeants and my deputies anywhere from four to eight overtime shifts a month on top of their 40 hours just to provide basic staffing levels. So you, you mentioned something, and you, Dr. Belovich, when we talked to him, he said that even if he had additional staff, he does not have the space to place them. Is that an accurate or did I misunderstand him? Because I think that was one of his frustrations as well, is um, the space available to even put additional personnel, which is needed. Um, because a number of individuals coming in with, with greater needs is there. That's correct. Um, and our, our obviously the, the mental health population has increased in the last few years. So the available mental health space, and it, we've done everything we can, but at some points um, the you have the security classification coupled with the mental health and medical. It takes a very unique set for... Um, find appropriate housing and that's what's becoming in, in short. And we have several plans uh, going forward to relieve some of that. And I, I know the, the supervisors have mentioned the depopulation efforts. And honestly, the jails were not depopulated by our, our mm -hmm. focus and our actions. It was a combination of releases were happening normally, the courts were releasing, that kind of thing. But with the implementation of the um, the court's orders and the emergency bail schedule, it just wasn't filling back up at the same pace. Um, so we did a few things to relieve the pressure. It wasn't filling back up, but now I think we're going to see that reversing. Today I'm at 13,479, which is up two or 300 just in a few weeks. So we are making uh, contingency plans to open up additional housing where we can doubling up everybody and trying to support Dr. Belovich and everything we can Excellent. to make available space for that. Excellent. And just for the record, I have a lot of admiration for Dr. Belovich. I think he's doing a tremendous job under difficult circumstances. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, my next question. I'm going to do it in twofold. I know we've got the body worn pilot program um, and I want to find out how that's going and also if that is if there are plans to expand that past a pilot well thank you for that question uh supervisor yeah uh we did the pilot at men's central jail on the 3000 floor uh in particularly with the k-10s and it was very um encouraging um and i think it'll go far also into helping us come into compliance with many of these measures the audio alone um, in, in concert with the DV tell, a lot of times on a body worn, all you're going to see is the back of another deputy or a pile for lack of a better term, but you get the audio and the audio alone will give us whether the D, the, um, the escalation efforts were happening or they weren't. And that's a big part of what the monitor's concern are. Was there active de-escalation attempts to, to mitigate the force before it occurred? And we're finding the body worn camera provides us with that um, audio alone on top of the good camera footage. And then combined with the DV tell, we can see the entire incident. Um, very encouraging. And then there's often grievances. Um, like I alluded to, my staff is short for sergeants. Grievances could take hours and hours of sergeants to review uh, to see if an incident or a contact occurred between a deputy and a person in our care the body worn camera would be able to provide that almost instantaneous and it cuts down a lot on the uh, the time and effort into the grievance. Uh, as a matter of fact, Judge Pragerson, the federal judge in our last status conference was very encouraged by it and he wanted an update on our uh, plan to roll it out. We're working with the CEO on, on the cost out uh, and combined with that, we need some upgrades to our DVTEL system, which was, that's from 2012 as well. Uh, I don't have a TV in my house from 2012, so these things are starting to get their their useful life is over and we need new servers and and hopefully we can get onto a cloud-based, which will um, help accommodate that. Because if you think supervisor on the body worn, the cost, uh, and patrol basically it's citizen contact or steering wheel to steering wheel. 
I will have as many, if not more cameras in the jails. And when do I turn them on and when do I turn them off? Because if I let them run constantly, that's a, uh, a level of, of uh, servers that we don't have. We just can't store that much video. So we're going to have to work with the policy and we'll work with the stakeholders to identify when, and when to turn it on and when not, which also gives the accountability. If they don't turn it on when they're supposed to, then we can hold them accountable. So it's a little complex. We're, we're working through it, um, but we're very encouraged by it. And we're working with the CEO to, to roll it out. We'll probably be in phases and then we'll, we'll hopefully the whole division will have it eventually. Okay, thank you. And then in closing, I just want to welcome you, Kathy Kenny. Um, I know that we did appreciate the work that Mr. Harris did. And, and actually, um, uh, Judge Pregerson has been also um, tremendous as it relates to holding us all accountable. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing to have reports that um, reflect the fact that we need we need to do better. I know, um, Sister Chief Corbett, you um, have have held yourself personally accountable when you come to this board. And Max, I appreciate the fact that you two work together. Um, but I think you know that we as a board um, want to work with you um, and with the monitor to make sure that we are. Um, moving in the right direction, um, and if staffing is an issue, it needs to be addressed um, across the board. If uh, if the fact that overcrowding exists, I know that we looked at that, and Supervisor Kuehl had mentioned it during COVID when we were releasing certain inmates. I don't know if that's still taking place, but my concern is that we're putting um, the the uh, safety of not only the individuals that we're housing at our jails, but also the sheriff's deputies um, uh, at risk by not addressing that um, in a timely fashion. So between the motion that Supervisor Solis did last two weeks ago and you know some of the recommendations here, I'm hoping that we can address that issue as well. But I thank you both and, and welcome you um, as our new monitor, um, Kathy Kinney. So thank you. Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, um, and uh, thank you, Assistant Sheriff Corbett. Uh, good to see you, sir. Um, I do have a question, though. Uh, it, it, you showed us the numbers for the Category 1 and Category 2 um, actions, uh, and then it looked like there were between 10 and 14 investigations, which seemed a lot lower than the total number of these incidents. Um, you know, one in just looking at it, would one would wonder why are there not more investigations of these incidents? Well, Supervisor, um, I think um, if you look at it quantitatively like that, it, it it looks like that. But but every use of force is investigated, and some of the minor um, policy violations are are dealt with at a lower level of of inquiry, uh, poli uh, performance log entry, additional training it wouldn't become a formal uh, in administrative investigation like this. But I'd also like to point out that, and we don't, and I've talked to actually um, Ms. Kenny about that, we don't do a good job of identifying preventive use of force. And I think if you say we have a thousand uses of force, we probably have five or 10 times that of force that was prevented by de-escalation and deputy intervention. And we don't do a good tr job of tracking that. I think we identified about three or 4,000 that it takes a supervisor to go in and actually make an entry to identify that. And we're looking at a better procedure to do that. And then hopefully that'll give you a better idea of the prevented uses of force as opposed to the uses of force, as opposed to the active investigations. Uh, in terms of the uh, findings of the monitors, um, the... Uh, you gave us numbers about all the people that went through de-escalation training, but the monitors yeah. opined it was ineffective. So I don't care if you had 15,000 people go through ineffective training. It doesn't sound like, you know, that was a great idea or, or a great use of resources. So the question I have is how shall we get at the nub of what is intended, which is that de-escalation tactics are used more often and actually effectively. If the training's no good or not effective, and I want to ask uh, uh, the, our monitor, Kathy Kenny, after you answer uh, their opinion of what, if, if there's an, 
way of identifying it what sort of made it ineffective, except to show that people didn't know how to de-escalate. But how would you uh, improve the use of de-escalation and improve the training? You know, I'll be honest with you, Supervisor, that um, in that report, that kind of took us off guard because the monitors were involved in creating the itinerary for our, our DVIRT training. Uh, they were very supportive of it, and they've reported to the board, I believe, just in the, in the previous how effective it was and how good we're doing with our compliance on that. So that kind of blindsided us on that. And I guess my answer to that will be, we are absolutely open to improving the itinerary, to improving the classes, to bringing in any other um, you know, expert we can from mental health, uh, anybody that can improve our, our itinerary on that. And um, we're a little disappointed to hear that. We thought we were doing well. We thought it was effective. I think our preventable use of force speaks to that. But if we can improve it, by all means, we're willing to listen and collaborate with anybody that can improve our, our, our material. And I think the body warrant will help that supervisor. I think that hearing the audio will validate that these efforts are being implemented and they're, they're actually being effective. Uh, Ms. Kenny, do you have a comment about the uh, critique of the training? I don't have specifics regarding the critique. Um, what we plan to do going forward, however, though, is I'm I'm going to have a chance to actually review the training and sit down with the department and see if there's any recommendations or any tweaks, as Assistant Sheriff has noted. If we, if myself and there will, should be a, a third monitor that is going to be appointed by the ACLU soon. So with sort of a new monitoring team in place. Um, our plan is to take a take another look at the training and see if there's recommendations that we can make back to the department on on improvement. I, I think I have the same question about the wrap policies. I mean, it, it's a little bit of a nightmare. It kind of reminds you of the old fashioned uh, yeah. kinds of straight jackets, you know, that people used to have, which also were thought to be quite effective. But um, the monitors indicated that the wrap policies were not generally followed. But in your report. Um, Assistant Sheriff, you indicated that they were. So I wonder, um, I'm sure you both believe that what you've said is correct, but I can't reconcile them. So perhaps, uh, I, I don't know who to ask first, but our monitor, uh, Ms. Kenny, the findings, if I'm not mistaken, were that where the RAP was used, the follow-up policies were not consistently followed. And Max may have found the same thing or know the same issues. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, my understanding with the RAP policy, and there has since, since, since the, that 10th report, there has been a new RAP directive that has been issued as well. And we'll be just having further discussions and comments back to the department on the new directive. But the directive that was in place at the time of that report I think one of the biggest failures that that the monitors noted was the fact that supervisors were not always uh, being authorized, not always authorizing it or being present when it was being used. And so the new policy does emphasize that and the training uh, does emphasize that as well. Yeah, we're very, yeah, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I, w I would also note of the cases that we've pulled to review for the next report, we did, we did specifically pull, pull a number of, or request a number of cases where the use of the RAP was, was being used to measure it against the policy to see if there's been any improvement in that area. Good, because we know very well the issuance of policy is not the same as a policy being followed. I mean, yes. we've seen that. Exactly. Not the only exactly. department. I mean, we, yes. we know that. Uh, the last thing I yes. want to ask is about head strikes. Uh, I may be a, a, a little bit of a uh, naif on this, but it sounds like they're reported as generally being quite dangerous, uh, consistently misused as we read the report. Uh, I don't understand what, why is it felt, Assistant Sheriff, that these are still necessary given the reports on uh, sort of the negative use of them? I, I'm... Let me, let me go back real quick, uh, Supervisor, if you don't mind, to the wrap. Uh, and I agree with what Ms. Kenny said. Uh, what we've done now is we have a log, an um, electronic version of the log, which we are able to now take data from to see how long an individual has been in there and, and that type of thing. So we're going to be able to provide data-driven specifics for the wrap 
and make sure it's in compliance with the, the directives and the eventual policy that's written with the stakeholders. Um, and as far as the head strikes, um, agreed that, and we all, uh, it's troubling to even see that they are continuing. We, we come out with a very more um, specific policy. We, we're trying not to prohibit them, but limit them. There are occasions where it's just the only resort an individual has, but you're right. It is, uh, it's problematic uh, and it's, it's dangerous, not only to the, um, the person involved, but the deputies, they end up hurting themselves. And we're trying everything, that's the last resort for lack of a better term. And we're trying to emphasize that with uh, training and this policy and accountability. And uh, we're hoping we get to the final uh, version of our, our hard policy, it will reflect all that. Um, and like Mr. Huntsman mentioned yesterday uh, that there was a news release of an individual in the IRC, it, it's a little disheartening to see something like that. But we took all the appropriate action, uh, all the notifications were made, all the proper um, investigation protocols were in place. It's just with all the hard work of the men and women every day in here, to see something like that is, is disheartening but I'm glad it's becoming the one-off and the rarity as opposed to a decade ago where it was the usual. So I think we've made great strides and I think we will continue to supervisor and this, the head force tracker and the policies are going in that direction. Uh, Ms. Kennedy, do you agree that there is a, a move toward an, a, or, or issuance of a new policy about this? That you've yes, seen? Uh, I have seen. I've had. I've seen the new policy and have a chance to comment. And I'll be talking to the department uh, soon about it as well. The one thing I would mention during my my initial visit, I did specifically ask a number of line staff if they were well, the deputies if they were aware of the new policy, and to to a person they all said they were, which I was impressed by because it hadn't been out all that long. And sometimes that message doesn't always trickle down. But I think management has put a huge emphasis on this and they all could articulate in their own words what it meant what the policy was they understood they're not supposed to be using them and that it should only be basically in life and death situations so i i was impressed that they showed that knowledge it, as you mentioned you can have good policy you can have good training so let's hope when the implementation kicks in that they they don't resort to using it either but i was impressed with that well i think it's even more important if people are aware of a policy that they be held accountable if they don't follow it. And I think that's right. that that's, that's really right. the only thing. You know, it's yep. we're always given lots of numbers and all of these things. Here's how many people took a class. Mm -hmm. But it reminds me of when uh, John Sharon used to say the difference between you counted how many times people went to a therapy session and just said he had 20, you know, appointments. And then the question is, yeah, but is he <laughs> still crazy? You know, I mean, like, right. was it right. effective? Did anything happen? So that's what I'm interested in in the numbers is uh, I like when they go down uh, if they're bad things, but I also want to know about uh, effectiveness. So I look forward to the continuing reports. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all. Thank you. Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I want to add my welcome to Kathy Kinney uh, as uh, our monitor and look, look uh, forward to working with you. So this report... Um, didn't have a county monitor. That's uh, correct because uh, Mark. That's correct. Yeah. Mr. Yep, Mr. Right. Harris Mark had. Gone. Yeah. Mark had resigned, and you your agreement hadn't been finalized yet. Um, right. But you'll be right in there on uh, all the ones uh, coming up. Uh, you know, uh, to me, this report was different from previous reports uh, because it, the monitors who were in the report basically said that the sheriff's department has stopped making progress towards compliance, especially in the areas of force and force reporting. And uh, they requested a status conference with the court, which I'm not sure has been done before. Uh, so first off, uh, I was going to ask um, either Assistant Sheriff Corbett or Max, what's the status of that conference uh that request of a status conference with the court i could address that supervisor um we did we did have our our the appearance before judge Fragerson a few weeks ago uh unfortunately 
based on some of the uh, the reporting in that that monitor's report, we we had to write a rebuttal, uh, which we presented to the judge, and um, Mr. Eliasberg presented his side. We presented ours. Um, I think the judge was um, satisfied that we agreed that we will move collaboratively forward to address these concerns of the monitors and that we are fully committed to get into compliance with this. I think he understood uh, some of our, our um, challenges with our staffing and budget. And he was very encouraged by the body worn camera. He asked for an update on that. He, uh, he basically asked for the parties to come back and um, discuss these things and how we can get past it. And he didn't implement any direction or anything of that matter. It was just basically uh, sit down and work this out and then get back to me. And that's what we're doing, I believe, in a few weeks. Uh, maybe Max, you could answer. Why do you think this is one of the first times that the monitors have asked for a status conference with the court? Uh, I hope you'll forgive me. I'm an old corruption prosecutor. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the process of consent decrees and monitoring is not a powerful force for reform. And uh, usually uh, it becomes somewhat calcified. And so as a result, monitor reports tend to be sort of, as Supervisor Kuehl was saying, they tell you the number of uh, therapy sessions somebody has had, not whether or not they're cured. No offense to the monitors. It's a it's a process that we we create in our legal system, and it's not incredibly effective most days. And that's why I believe that you just saw um, an amazing event that doesn't happen often in which the monitors get so frustrated mm -hmm. that they speak out of turn in a manner that, that you have become accustomed to with me because that's who I am, but uh, not the way they usually work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's upsetting because I remember at the last uh, Rose's presentation, I had mentioned that it seemed like the Sheriff's Department had reached a plateau uh, in their progress. And I was asking about a, a plan to get past that uh, plateau. But now it looks like we may be backsliding. So this was not a, a great report to, to read for me. Uh, I think some of the noteworthy findings were, particularly as it related to head strikes. I know we've had a couple of conversations here about that. Um, and I'm a little confused on, is uh, Assistant Sheriff Corbett, you kind of uh, alluded to the fact that the policy might be a little, uh, I wouldn't say vague, but it seems like it's okay in some situations, but not okay in other situations. So I'm concerned because one of the other um, findings was that there were no repercussions for uses of force that were out of policy. So is what you're maybe telling me is that uh, there were no repercussions for some of the head strikes because they were within policy? That's correct, Supervisor. Um, but the overwhelming um, opinion of everybody, and, and we agree with the, the monitors, we agree with the stakeholders, um, the analogy I use to to my deputies and my personnel is is I'm a football fan. It's Tom Brady. You just don't hit a quarterback in the head anymore. It's against the rules and it's not good. So they get it, and that's that's. So so should that be the policy? We and that's what we we've written that into the policy, Supervisor. The only confusion is we 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 titled it the prohibited use of force. Prohibited indicates it's never allowed. So we're, we're trying to work on... So, on so when the report says improper head strikes, what are they referring to? They're, they're looking at force from a year or two ago, which they, in um, their evaluations, did not think that the, the use of a head strike was a proper um, use of force within our policy in that incident. So at this point, has there been any uh, consequences or repercussions for well, yes, ma'am. We, we, we've done, opened some investigations on that. There's been discipline imposed on that. Yes. Because there also seemed to be a sense that if there are no repercussions uh, for this and other uses of force that are out of policy, it, it there's no incentive to um, make better strides towards compliance. I, agreed. And discipline is uh, meant and, and created to improve behavior, change behavior. 
and the use of uh, discipline and accountability is important. And, and as you can see, we've opened up a lot of administrative investigations. We are continuing to uh, do that. And actually with the help of the monitors, they provide a basic che checklist for our supervisors as they're writing their force reports to know what the monitors are looking for to be in compliance and to be doing that. And we'll re reference that for the sergeants to look at to address every use of force. Um, and I, again, and I know that um, our lawyers as well as, as the sheriff's department sort of disagreed uh, with some of these uh, findings and felt like um, we're in compliance with 75% of the pr provisions and that should actually be celebrated. Um, I mean, I get that, but I, I just don't know if there's anyone here who would sort of uh, use the word that we were celebrating uh, that we're only 75% in compliance. I think this board has been pretty clear on trying to get to uh, the 100% compliance. So just know from my perspective, uh, really w want the next report to reflect uh, a, a lot more in terms of getting towards our uh, our goal. Um, and I will say uh, two things, and, and Max, you, you alluded to them. It's not really part of this report, but, uh, you know, I was pretty disgusted when you uh, forwarded us uh, the the uh, photos of uh, uh, sort of quietly stepping aside through the locker room when you were on the tour and seeing those insignias that uh, uh, represented the Proud Boys and Three Percenters. I mean, it's, it's just unfathomable to me that any of our um, LA County Sheriff's deputies would have had anything uh, to do uh, with the January 6th insurrection and the violent um, armed mob that was attempting to overthrow our government. So hopefully, um, you know, you've got uh, my full support to continue to uh, work in cooperating and investigating um, that. Uh, in my opinion, they have no place here. Uh, in LA County. I also uh, heard this morning driving in on KNX, and I guess now ABC Channel 7 has broken the story uh, about the inmate that was uh, allegedly uh, beaten by not one, but several deputies in the uh, inmate reception center. Um, that's very disturbing. Uh, Assistant Sheriff Corbett seemed to think it was a one-off. I looked at your face when he said that, and you uh, didn't necessarily agree that that was a one-off. Um, that's very troubling, and I, I always go back to uh, wondering if there were no uh, cameras, um, would any of these uh, incidents be brought to anybody's attention? So did you want to speak to that, Max? Yeah, no, it's, it wasn't a one-off because in the end of June, a gentleman cold-cocked a deputy, and uh, he, he ended up with a broken bone and head strikes, uh, feet, feet or elbows, I forget what it was, to the back of his head. So it happened two weeks earlier in the exact same place. And so it was not a one-off or a surprise. It's, it's the culmination of overcrowding. And uh, yes, the, we should vastly overstaff our jails in order to, to not have overcrowding. But as uh, Dr. Belovich tells you, there's a limit to the physical space available. Well, the Constitution has a remedy for that, which is we're not allowed to stuff more people into a jail than we can take care of in a way that's safe for the deputies and safe for the prisoners. And so this, the Constitution has a very clear remedy, which has not been implemented. And as a result, the Attorney General's in town looking around, and uh, it's not a one-off. It's not unique. There's nothing, there's nothing that hasn't been happening for a long time here and, and isn't getting worse now to back in the ways it was uh, under Baca. So it's not new. Yeah, uh, I appreciate it. Well, it's very disturbing. And I, I, I mean, I agree with Supervisor Barger that, uh, you know, we, we are – you know, we're supportive of more staffing uh, and reducing the population. We were really proud of how that went uh, during the pandemic. And we thank the sheriff uh, for his work on reducing the population during uh, the pandemic, which meant that it can be done. Uh, and it was done without any risk to, to the public safety. Uh, so uh, we got to figure out how to keep moving in that direction to reduce the population. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Solis? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and I um, want to thank everyone for their presentation. Um, I believe this is now our 10th report 
to the board regarding um, the Rosas settlement. And of course, we know that this report is supposed to help inform us to show how the sheriff's department is in compliance and how the systems and players are are handling the challenges that uh, that we're faced with right now. And seems to me um, a lot of good questions have been asked by my colleagues, so I don't want to repeat them. But I do want to say that I am very concerned about uh, the report as it reads uh, the areas uh, using the head strikes, which has been brought up by several of my colleagues, out, as well as the wrap restraint system. I know that those continue to be of concern to uh, the monitors. And so I think we need to really look closely at that and understand what the sheriff's department is going to be doing to rectify that. I have a picture here in front of me that depicts what the wrap restraint system, what it looks like. and. I don't know how that really functions. It looks like someone's wrapped up like a mummy. Um, and I don't know if that provides the necessary protection or if it's if it's too much. And I understand they also place a kind of a, what they call a spit hood over the subject's head as well. And they have their back and the cuffs and ankle hobble are tethered to a metal chair. So I don't know what that constitutes, but it doesn't sound uh, very uh, humane to me, but I think I'd have to see more uh, how that is displayed and how it really works. Because I, just by looking at that, uh, gives me some, give me some, gives me some pause. Um, and I know that the Inspector General, since last several years, 2018 to be sure, has brought many of these issues before us. And I am uh, continually concerned about some of the areas that I think still need to have resolution and still need to be fixed and we can't just keep passing the buck and one of the things i think is very disturbing to me is and the rosas monitors uh point this out is again uh deputies are are falsifying uh the use of force reports and it's disturbing to me because it seems that um the reports are are based on on whether uh incarcerated person is disciplined or not or charged with another offense but if these things are, are indeed happening and we're not getting the right information, those can end up being life-changing rulings that can harm individuals and have an impact on someone's life because of the way those reports are written up. And for me, personally speaking, for someone who has a badge and are, are supposed to be held to the higher standards and deliberately lies on a report that taints the entire system, and process, and I would like to know, uh, and this is directed to to the sheriff, uh, what happens, uh, especially when we know that there are deputies or others that are falsifying reports, and what discipline uh, has taken place, and what measures are in place to um, discipline these officers. I understand that this may not even uh, has may may not has may not have been used against the executive level staff which I think is very important as well, because it isn't just the line staff that are the problem, but it's also the leadership. And we have to hold people accountable. And if there's no change in terms of policy, policy interpretation, then we do have a problem with our, our culture there. And I would like to ask uh, the sheriff uh, if you could please respond to that. Well, thank you, Supervisor. Uh, and actually I've had this uh, exact conversation with uh, Ms. Kenny. Um, I, I think some of the monitor's reflection of, of um, false reports is confusing a, a cut and pasting type of mentality as opposed to as articulating the, what the events occurred. And then we go back to reviewing the video and they have a video admonishment and they have to view the video and then clean up the, the report. And I think what we've done is kind of set up our personnel for a bit of a failure with just giving them a blank piece of paper and saying, write what happened, as opposed to giving them a template uh, to follow and identify and clearly uh, articulate what they saw, what they perceived, and what their actions were. Uh, these are first line level entry um, young men and women from the academy that don't have a lot of experience in writing. And again, uh, uh, my supervisors and my sergeants are, they don't have the time to work with them to, to teach them and mentor as they should. So our, our emphasis is gonna be on report writing and, and try to get away from the jargon, clearly identify what you saw, 
what the threat you saw and what you did. And we think if we, we work with the monitors and the stakeholders to give a little bit different form to fill out in a different way, it will, it will uh, push them towards a more clear and concise manner of writing as opposed to just they're, they're struggling and trying to articulate what they're trying to say, but they, they have trouble finding the word sometimes. I don't think it's, it's um, and, and again, if we find that we watch a video and what they write is totally opposite, no, now that's, that's um, dishonesty and we address that appropriately. But what about the issue regarding the executive, uh, you know, management staff? And what are they doing to help instill this philosophy, this change that should be occurring? I don't see that as part of the response here. I, I believe what you're, you're mentioning, Supervisor, is how the monitors mentioned as the, the uh, use of force review goes through the, the different processes and the unit commander and the commander. And if we're not identifying correctly what they're, what they're indicating as a policy violation, they want them accountable. Um, we're revisiting that and we'll work with the monitors on, on that kind of accountability. Again, the monitors provided us with a, um, a spreadsheet of what they're looking for, for our executives now to look and I try to identify more clearly problems that the monitors are bringing to our attention. It, it seems to me that um, I think in one of your documents, you show that there's a refresher course, so to speak, that management goes through. I think that in particular probably has to be rethought of and looked at and these items have to be brought up because and, if we don't get to the culture at the highest level it's never going to change you cannot blame the line staff for not writing appropriate reports i think it's about a policy that's you know that's valued and how people share those values in terms of team leadership and i would think that that's something that would be of high priority for us so I, I would hope that that gets that, that gets back and that it really it does foster some change there because it is uh, it's not uh, it's not adequate the response that that uh, you're presenting at this point. I'm sorry. Um, right, that point, uh, uh, Supervisor, as soon as this report was received, I met with my commanders and and my training, and just to that point, I want to revisit the uh, the training for our sergeants and our lieutenants, and mm -hmm. to look at that with a different uh, perspective of a different lens, a lot of it to uh, mirror what, what the monitors uh, are bringing to our attention. We, we've already addressed that. We're looking at changing that specifically. Right. I also wanted to um, ask, uh, I, it's been brought to my attention that the civil brand commissioners who go into the jails and conduct inspections that um, past practice for a long time, they could go in unescorted. And now I understand that that has changed. Uh, why has that changed? Why is it that they have to have an escort now that goes in with them to well, uh, inspect the jails? So what we were finding, Supervisor, was um, they would go in and they would do their uh, their interviews and then they would publish their report. And we wouldn't, for a month or two later, get the results of that report and then have to backtrack to find the inmate or the area that, that they had concerns about and I don't, I don't like to use the term escort, but, but so we wanted to do is have somebody accompany them uh, loosely and not be involved with the interview. And then um, if there was concerns or issues, we can immediately address it right then and there. Uh, I and I actually had a conversation with uh, Mark Anthony last weekend about this. Mm -hmm. And I think we're gonna find some sort of resolve where um, they, they won't need that accompaniment, but it, what they agreed to is at the, the conclusion of their visit, they will immediately go to the watch commander and bring up any concerns that need to be addressed immediately. And I think that'll be a, a, a workable option that we could all work with. Well, I think just one of my own observations when I previously visited the, the women's jail, I saw a lot of things that were pretty disturbing to me and I went along with some of the um, commissioners. This was almost two years ago, I think maybe longer than that, before COVID obviously. But I think you have to understand that uh, there has to be anonymity because you don't want to also then have deputies retaliating against someone who's going to say, hey, I wasn't seen by a medical doctor. It took three, six weeks to have someone view an abscess that I had in my mouth or that I wasn't given appropriate uh, medication because I'm having severe menstrual cramps, things of this nature that are very basic. 
And I, I remember bringing this up and I've yet to see how we can resolve that. And that to me, again, is something that I would hope our monitors and that you all working together can help address. So I don't think you go back and talk to the, to the inmate or the person that, that's detained and get information that way necessarily, because I do believe that these, these stories are not being fabricated when I, in fact, in one visit that I had saw that. So, I, I mean, I would just really want to um, impress that upon, upon you and, and the staff. You know, I respect everyone that, that has their job and their duty, but we also expect people to be doing their job in the best manner and, and equitable and fair manner that is accountable to everyone, to our public. And that's, that's what I think we want to stress here. So if I could just, um, you know, really emphasize how important that is. Um, thank you very much, Sheriff. I, I do want to ask a question of our Inspector General. And I wanted to, to ask you, Max, um, as you know, there is a force review panel that is several that has several high ranking sheriff staff, OIG, county council and others to review use of force. However, I'd like to get your opinion on how effective that panel really is. Because while it may look good on paper, but perhaps you can share the purpose of the panel and whether you think it has made any impact on one, limiting head strikes, two, use of the wrap restraint system, three, reducing use of force, four, increased discipline at all levels when it comes to misuse of force, and five, falsification of reports, and six, long-standing cultural shifts on the use of force. My staff has monitored it closely, and it is their opinion that it is totally ineffective in all those things you just listed. Uh, the custody uh, force review team is an excellent, highly skilled group of investigators, and they have always been used for serious force incidents under the uh, ROSA segment. They were expanded out to allegations of retaliation, other kinds of force. Um, but it's been our, my staff's opinion, based on observing, that they're not used properly and they're not effective. The panel that it goes through is run by commanders. And uh, we've always seen in the Sheriff's Department a real problem in force evaluation in which the training bureau, the sort of equivalent thereof for the uh, department in general, will be brought into a team and will be very reluctant to give their opinion until they get sort of a, a wink and a nod from their commanders about what they ought to have as their opinion. And then when they do give it, they tend to be very protective of deputies and very sort of always saying, well, if there's a head strike, there was a reason and it's okay. I'm not saying custody force review is like that, but we've seen a, desert, uh, a disturbing trend in that direction, that they seem to be not be asked for their opinion, not be incorporated in, and it's my staff's opinion that they should be much more um, always included, always their opinion given, and it should always be acted on unless there's a darn good reason not to. And then we would be hopeful that that process would be more effective. Currently, it does not appear to be, although I am not sure that if we did what I just said, it would all work out because as long as there's a commander there leaning on them, then they might learn that their opinion is different than they thought it was. But but for the moment, it's it's not functioning well in our opinion. So, so it kind of goes back to my earlier question to the sheriff about culture and making sure that our top level management and executive folks really understand that culture has to change and that we're being also reviewed and evaluated and could can be fined heavily by uh, the federal government uh, under this uh, court decree if we don't make those changes. And I think this is very serious. And so I hope that um, again, you know, Sheriff Department will work cooperatively with everyone here. We wanna see this change um, we're now uh, in the year 2022. We're going, we're going to quickly be into 2023. A lot can change, and I hope that it does for the better, for our sake and for our residents. And I hope that you will help provide that leadership. And this is to the Sheriff Department, because I know there are many young people that are now your recruits that are coming in that want to step up and help provide protection to our, to our residents, whether it's in custody or out on the street. And I would hope that the training would be reflective of the values that we have set forward, that, that even the policies that you are now espousing should be uh, mirrored. And so it can only happen by example. So talk is talk, but walking the walk is different. So I'll just leave it with that. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for giving us the opportunity to hear this report. Thank you.
Supervisor Solis, thank you very much. And I want to thank all my colleagues for this uh, very robust, thoughtful conversation. If I could just piggyback on a comment made by Supervisor Solis. Um, it was my understanding from my um, current and previous civil brand commissioner, it wasn't a matter of just being escorted through the, through the facility, but it was also in terms of the, their ability to walk freely to, to identify areas that they wanted to see in the facility had been severely limited. Um, heard similar reports from other, other oversight entities. So um, that's the, what the issue I'd like to bring to your attention, um, Assistant Sheriff Corbett. It's not just about being escorted, but also severely limiting what they had access to. And I think that's critical because you raised the point that these entities have been walking through the facility, so you didn't think some of the issues that have come out in terms of the the um, material that's been found, the inappropriate material that's been found in the jails and the KKK, you know, insignias, and your assumption that they are are new because people hadn't seen them before. Well, the reality is people have been very limited in terms of areas that they've been able to walk through the jail. So I think it's important uh, that you know that and we figure out how we can go back to the way it was before. Last quick comment for me um, has to do with retaliation, another issue that Supervisor Solis raised. You know, the, the ROSIS agreement requires that the Custody Force Review Committee analyze investigations related to grievances that allege force based on retaliation. In the last year, how many administrative investigations has the Sheriff Departed, Department opened as a result of this analysis on grievances that allege force based on retaliation? That's my question. And, and if any of them, um, if, if, the, if the department had ever founded or taken action on those investigations. I don't have that number uh, handy, Supervisor. I will have to get that for you. I'll absolutely uh, be happy to provide that. Um, and to your first comment about not having access to some places, one of the conversations I had with Mr. Anthony last week was, if there's an area we're saying was restricted from possibly a, a crime investigation or something, I agreed to give him documentation as to why that was not available to him. And, and we think that'll help then identify why they weren't allowed into an area. And then it makes my people accountable why they didn't let them in. So we're working on that as well. But I will get the, uh, the retaliation grievances and the, and the numbers for you um, and then present it to you. Thank you very much. Again, thanks uh, to Assistant Sheriff Corbett, uh, Mr. Huntsman, our OIG, and again um, to our new county monitor, uh, Kathy Kinney. Uh, we appreciate all of you for your time um, and answering our questions today. Thank you all. Um, colleagues, this is re report is received and filed and hearing no objections, such will be the order. We're moving into specials, uh, and we have two before us today. Um, Supervisor Barger, would you like to present yours, followed by Supervisor Solis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was saddened to read a heartbreaking story in the news this morning on the front page of the LA Times regarding a young man, Dominic Green, who was a contracted worker for the Department of Public Health and passed away. Tragically, he was fully remote, and neither his colleagues nor supervisors were aware that he had died at home where he was left unattended for days. That, this raises renewed concerns for the health and well-being of our workforce who work from home full-time and might be suffering from isolation and disconnection. I'd like to read in a motion with Supervisor Hahn as a co-author for a vote next week um, so that the Department of Human Resources can report back on the issue and recommend ways the county can improve the way we stay connected with our workforce. The COVID-19 pandemic resulting public health orders sent scores of employees to work from home. This was especially true for a large portion of Los Angeles County workforce and thousands of contracted staff who help maintain essential county services. The county has continued to greatly expand flexible working options with the 35% of the county workforce teleworking in some capacity, including 15% who telework full-time. 
In addition, county departments often have distributed teams in various county locations to meet operational needs. Telework, compressed work weeks, for example, 980 and 440, or other flexible working arrangements can serve as a valuable tool to reduce overhead costs, improve work-life balance, reduce carbon footprint, and advance digital government. At the same time, allowing employees to work outside the traditional workplace brings about new challenges in maintaining regular communication and strong professional relationships. For many remote workers, it's created physical and mental health challenges. A 2021 survey by the American Psychiatric Association found that a majority of employees working from home experience negative mental health impacts, including isolation and loneliness. Furthermore, a lack of physical presence in the workspace limits opportunities for interaction and checking in on workers who might fall ill or suffer from an ailment leading to even more dramatic health or well-being issues. So I therefore move that the, we therefore move that the Board of Supervisors direct the Director of Personnel in collaboration with the Chief Executive Office, County Council and Executive Officer to review telework practices to ensure regular communication and engagement protocols between managers, supervisors, and staff in all settings, including telework, hoteling, remote work, distributed teams, and uh, field work. Two, direct the Director of Personnel to review current supervision training courses and or programs to ensure content on instruction and communication in all work settings, including remote work, telework, hoteling, distributed uh, teams, and field work, and confirm that the uh, training discusses communications, best practices by managers and supervisors about conducting wellness checks of their staff who have been absent from the work without notice. And three, report back to this board in writing within 75 days with an assessment of the aforementioned and any recommendations to enhance and improve existing policies as needed. That would be our motion for next week. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And uh, Madam Ex Executive Officer, we're not voting on this one today. We are voting on this we are one voting today. On this oh, I thought, I didn't think we could vote on it. It's a report back. It's a report back. Okay, well, okay, that, I, I would love to vote on it today. Okay, excellent. Dominic Green's family would love for us to vote on it today. Yes. And I'd like to second it. Okay, okay so okay. motion by um, Supervisor Kuehl, did you want to speak on it? Supervisor Kuehl, did you want to no, speak on it? No, I was offering to second, but I defer to my colleague from the fourth. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Hahn. Please call the <clears> roll. <throat> The motion um, from Supervisor Barger and Supervisor Hahn supporting Los Angeles County Teleworkers is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We will hear uh, an additional sec uh, special from Supervisor Solis that we will also be voting on. Um, after her presentation, Supervisor Solis. Thank, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is with respect to a reward offer in the robbery at the 99 Ranch Market in Rolling Heights, which took place on Saturday, July 9th, 2022 at the 99 Ranch Market on Nogales Avenue. Just after noon, an Asian American couple was violently attacked by two suspects while unloading groceries in their vehicle. One of the suspects pistol whipped the male victim to steal his Rolex watch. The two suspects then left the scene in a white Dodge Challenger with paper license plates. The two suspects are described as two men between the ages of 25 to 30 years old wearing black hoodies and gray sweatpants. The suspects were also carrying semi-automatic handguns. To assist in the investigation of violent robbery of these two victims, we're seeking the public's assistance in bringing the individuals who are responsible for these crimes to justice. If the public has any information about this case or those responsible, we urge them to contact the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department Walnut Station at 909-595-2264. Those who wish to remain anonymous can call anonymous can call Crime Stoppers at 800-222-8477. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors establish a $15,000 reward in exchange for information leading to the apprehension and conviction of the person or persons responsible for this heinous robbery that occurred outside the 99 Ranch Market in Roland Heights. I ask for your I vote. Thank you very much. Second. 
It's been, oh, thank you very much. Um, seeing no further comments, uh, the special motion has been moved by Supervisor Solis and seconded by Supervisor Kuehl. Please call the roll. Motion by Supervisor Solis on the reward offered. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you, colleagues. At this time, it would be appropriate to hear adjournments. We will begin with Supervisor Hahn. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And the first one uh, is, I know, uh, one of the reasons that Supervisor Barger, you introduced uh, the motion that we just voted on. And I really appreciate that. Um, I, I thought it was appropriate that we adjourn in the memory of Dominic Green today. Um, the LA Times, uh, Kira Feldman, in column one today, wrote uh, the most heartbreaking um, story about Dominic Green. Um, he was only 28 years old. Um, and I, I know Supervisor Mitchell, I think I reached out to you. He His apartment was in Koreatown, but he... Um, his family was from uh, Michigan, I think. Uh, he came here, uh, you know, following his dream, uh, and he became a contract worker for our Department of Public Health uh, and tracking COVID cases. So he was doing contract uh, tracing. And this was his first job out of grad school where he received a master's degree in public health. Um, and again, he moved to L.A. Uh, late last summer. Uh, he even took his college courses from inside his bedroom due to the COVID shutdown in 2020. Uh, he saw this job as first step towards his professional goal, uh, a doctorate in uh, uh, epidemiology, which he planned to use to serve underserved communities. And although he never met his colleagues in person because he was teleworking, uh, some of their comments at his service uh, really spoke to his character. He would every day, I think at 4.30, log out and send a message to his supervisors that his day's work was done, wished everybody well, and then he would log back on the next morning. Well, one uh, Thursday, I think right before MLK Day, so one Thursday, he didn't do his regular 4.30 sign-off. And then the Friday, he didn't do his 8.30 sign-on or the, or the 4.30 sign-off. His parents didn't hear from him that whole weekend. But in this article, they said that wasn't unusual because sometimes, I know I have some kids that I don't hear from uh, for a weekend, and you don't suspect anything. But when they... Couldn't get a hold of him. I think Monday was the holiday, and then a Tuesday was the work day, and nobody had heard from him. They finally um, took measures to um, get to his apartment. By then, he uh, had passed away, and apparently, he'd he'd been dead for a few days, based on the coroner's report. Of course, his parents were devastated, uh, and uh, really wondered, and which is why, Catherine, I think your motion w was so appropriate today, because I think his parents wondered, boy, when we didn't hear the first sign-off and then the second one, why why didn't someone in uh, the Department of Public Health, one of his supervisors, actually take a little more aggressive action? So hopefully what, what you just did, Catherine, will look at our policy, which is so appropriate because Teleworking is now something I think is not just pandemic related. I think more and more workers will be working from home. And this just highlights being alone, working from home, and having no real support system could end up like this. I thought um, what his coworkers from, from public health uh, sent to uh, his parents uh, to, to be read at the, his service was, Dominic was known by his strong work ethic and character, uh, uh, wrote uh, one of his supervisors, character is what a person does when no one is looking. Uh, another said, Dominic was a fabulous uh, epidemiologist, a great person to work with, a valued member of the team. 
And someone else said, Dominic and I were in the same cohort, and we co-boarded to get onboarded together, one woman wrote. Though we only shared a few emails here and there, he was very kind and will be strongly missed. He survived by his parents, uh, Joseph and Janine Green, um, and I think uh, they will appreciate the fact that, that, that we uh, remembered him and we're looking at county policy to change so this never happens again. Um, yes, that would be great. Uh, I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Antonia Bueno, uh, who was a resident of San Pedro. She was born in Ischia, uh, Italy, um, and she was uh, preceded in death by her, hus her husband. She survived by her children, George, Teresa, Oreste, and Frank, who's the very successful owner of Bueno's Pizzeria uh, that have uh, several locations, both in Long Beach and San Pedro. Uh, may she rest in peace. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Debbie Roman, who was only 49 when she passed away, uh, also a longtime San Pedro resident. Debbie graduated from USC with her master's in education. She was a beloved kindergarten teacher at 7th Street Elementary for over 20 years, and she always encouraged her students to work hard, aim high, and believe in themselves. She survived by her husband, Eddie, and deeply missed by her family, friends, and former colleagues. I also thought it was appropriate if, if this board adjourned in the memory of Shinzo Abe, uh, the former uh, Japanese prime minister, who was assassinated last week while delivering a campaign speech outside of a train station in Nara just days before his country's nationwide parliamentary elections. Uh, Shinzo Abe became Japan's youngest post-war prime minister during his first stint in the nation's highest office from 2006 to 2007. He returned as prime minister in 2012 and served until 2020, leaving office as Japan's longest-serving prime minister. I was lucky to be a member of Congress um, when he came and addressed a joint session of Congress in 2015 and how fondly he spoke about the United States and his time in Los Angeles uh, in the late 70s when he was a student at USC. In that address to Congress, he characterized the alliance between the United States and Japan as an alliance of hope. I can't help but think that perception was shaped by his experience here in LA County. That this tragedy has rocked the nation of Japan and the attack is all the more shocking to the Japanese people because their country has not experienced the level of gun violence that we have sadly become so accustomed to here. Our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Japan. Shinzo Abe leaves his wife of 35 years, Aki Matsuzaki, um, and I would hope that we as a county would express in a formal way to the Japanese uh, Council General uh, here of our sincerest sympathies. Thank you, madam. All members? All members? Yes. Is that possible? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. That'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, as a member of the state Senate delegation in 2017, we had the opportunity to have audience with him in Tokyo. So I would definitely love to sign in as well. Thank you so much for bringing that forward to allow all of us to sign on. Thank you. Supervisor Barker. Thank you. I move that when we adjourn, we adjourn, do so in memory of Madeline Jones Barber, a longtime resident of Altina who passed away at the age of 55. Madeline attended Pasadena Unified School District Public Schools and graduated from Blair High School in 1984. She pursued higher education at the University of Laverne, where she earned a bachelor's degree in business. For 17 years, Madeline worked with the Nestle Corporation as a budget analyst and finished her career with the AIDS Healthcare Foundation as an advanced operations specialist. In April of 2021, Madeline became a member of the Altadena Town Council. She worked closely with town council members on various projects such as crosswork installation and crossing guard reassignment projects at Altadena Arts Magnet. Madeline is survived by her husband and son and her two siblings. Also that we adjourn in memory of Jamie Denise Kennedy, a longtime resident of Santa Clarita and 1989 Santa Clarita Valley Woman of the Year who passed away at the age of 74. Jamie grew up in Santa Clarita Valley and spent decades volunteering for several organizations, including the Boys and Girls Club of, of Santa Clarita Valley, 
the Santa Clarita Valley Crisis Hotline, and the American Red Cross. She worked the United Way of Greater Los Angeles for many years, which was the start of a long career in community service. Not only was she a talented fundraiser, she was also an exemplary leader. In 2005, she led the effort with Project Town Angels to bring a family affected by Hurricane Rita to Santa Clarita and provide for all their needs. The family was given an apartment rent-free for a year. They received donations of food, clothes, and furniture. A job was secured for the husband and the mother, was able to get her high school diploma, and then entered nursing school. Her love for animals led, to her, led her to serve on the board of the Carousel Ranch Therapy on horseback, and she was a member of an organization dedicated to the preservation of gibbon apes. She also spent time raising exotic birds. Jamie is remembered as someone who radiated positivity and love. Also that we adjourn in memory of Carolyn Melnick, a third grade teacher for, 35, or for 34 years at Sunnydale Elementary School in Lancaster. She died at the age of 80 after a 13 year battle with lung cancer. Born October 7, 1941 in Little Rock, Arkansas, she passed away June 26 at home in Lancaster surrounded by her family. Carolyn was educated at Hendricks College and the University of Arkansas, where she earned a master's degree in education. On August 6, 1966, she married Kenneth Mellick, and they had two daughters. Carolyn was a passionate teacher who always put her students first. She believed in instilling a lifelong passion for learning and literacy to all the students at Sunnydale School. Carolyn is survived by her husband, two daughters, and four grandchildren. Also that we adjourn in memory of Bella Myers, who passed away June 29th at the age of 105. She was born February 16, 1917 in Table Rock, Nebraska. She was married for 65 years to David Myers. She survived by her daughter, Catherine Freeman, granddaughters Rebecca Jones, Jennifer Cronick, and Deborah Emerson, eight great-grandchildren and 12 great-great-grandchildren. And last, that we adjourn in memory of Jim Nickel a Lancaster resident and a teacher for more than 30 years in both public and private schools in the Antelope Valley. Born April 10, 1942, Jim spent a life of learning and teaching of both the Bible and science. Jim taught science classes in middle school and high school for more than 40 years. He attended Grace Chapel in Lancaster for more than 30 years and taught Bible study classes there as well. Jim is survived by his wife, Loretta, son, Lauren, daughter, Larissa, four grandchildren, and four siblings. Those are my adjournments, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Fazalat Dalla, who passed away on Monday, July 4th, 2022, after a courageous battle with cancer. A native of Toronto, Canada, Fazalat trained and worked as a pharmacist in her hometown before moving to Alhambra, California. In Alhambra, she served as a science teacher at Mark Keppel High School for nearly 20 years. During her tenure at Mark Keppel, she developed a reputation as a stern yet kind spirited teacher who was passionate about the youth that she served. On campus, Ms. Dalla was involved in the California Scholarship Foundation and worked to promote animal rights through student groups and clubs. Her colleagues fondly recall her eagerness to participate in the goofy things, helping to organize various student assemblies and Mark Keppel's Science Olympiad. In her personal time, Ms. Dalla traveled, painted, did yoga, and pilates. She survived by her husband, Robert Dalla, sister Fatima Jaffer, as well as many members of her extended family in Canada. Fazalat Dalla was loved by everyone who had the pleasure of knowing her, and she will be deeply missed. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Kent Lund. Kent Lund was born on February 11th, 1933 in Brooklyn, New York, and passed away on Friday, June 10th, 2022, at the age of 89. Ken was a veteran of the U.S. Army. After the service, Ken and his family settled in West Covina, where he was a highly active volunteer in the Rotary Club of West Covina, the West Covina Historical Society, and the Emanate Health Foundation, and served on the board of directors of all three. For decades, Lund personally led hands-on volunteered at countless programs and events advancing youth leadership, promoting health and well-being, preventing domestic abuse, addressing local hunger, and advancing local civic involvement. He was a pillar in the community 
and his volunteerism, keen insight and kind spirit, boundless curiosity and devotion to family, friends, and his city exemplified service above self. Ken Lund is survived by his wife, Ruth Lund, son, Peter Lund, and daughter, Victoria Downey, and a host of extended family members and friends who will miss Ken dearly. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Fred Sornoso, former Monterey Park Pro Tem. Fred Sornoso passed away on July 8th after a prolonged illness. First elected to the Monterey Park City Council in March of 2020, Fred was known for his friendliness and accessibility, with colleagues remembering that even when they disagreed, Mayor Pro Tem Sornoso treated everyone with kindness and warmth. On City Council, he established community cleanups, encouraged residents to report graffiti to keep Monterey Park safe and a clean community for all residents. And above all, Fred embodied what it meant to be a good neighbor. He loved to take walks around the neighborhood and often invited members of the community to collect fruit from his home. He was known especially for his delicious persimmons and apples. Fred was also a lifelong fan of the Los Angeles Dodgers. When he made the decision to resign from the city council, he specifically chose April 14th as it was opening day for the Dodgers season in recent weeks. Mr. Sornoso was able to root for the Dodgers in their series against the Chicago Cubs. Fred Sornoso will be deeply missed by friends, families, colleagues, and Monterey Park, the neighborhood that he loved so dearly. May his love for his community be an example for all of us who work in public service. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Jesse Varela. Jesse Barella was born on November 12, 1956 to Jose Arriaga Barella and Librada Ch Chaidez Rodriguez.